Good morning, and at this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? Start recording in progress. Rec recording to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Thank you, and you may start with your opening statement, Sergeant Biondo. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Youth Services. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes? Once again, all panelists, please turn on your video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation, Chair Rose. We are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant of Arms. Um, and thank you all for joining our virtual hearing today on this very important issue, the youth count. Good morning. My name is Debbie Rose and I'm the chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Youth Services. Today, the Committee on Youth Services is conducting an oversight hearing on youth count, which is administered by the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development. I'd like to recognize that we've been joined by my council colleagues, council member Eugene, council member Lewis, and council member Riley. At today's hearing, the Committee on Youth Services will examine the youth counts methodology, planning, process, and resources, and ways to improve it to capture a more accurate estimate of unsheltered homeless youth in New York City. The committee will also explore how youth count was adapted in the environment of COVID-19 outbreak and will solicit feedback from advocates, providers, and members of the affected population about the issues plaguing youth count and how to address them. Every year, the city conducts a citywide point in time count of homeless adults, youth, and families in New York based on the guidelines that were issued by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. The Homeless Outreach um, Population Estimate, or HOPE, is used to gauge the size of the unsheltered homeless population in New York City, including homeless youth under the age of 24. Youth Count serves as a supplement to HOPE to capture unsheltered homeless youth who, have, who were not counted in the HOPE count. The resultant numbers are then used as a base to determine how much fun funding is to be allocated towards runaway and homeless youth services, a social service sector that is described by advocates as starved and grossly under-resourced. Given the crucial role that youth count results play in the decisions regarding resources and services to be funded and provided to an extremely vulnerable and disproportionately traumatized population, unsheltered homeless youth. It is imperative to ensure that such estimates are as accurate as possible. And to do that, it is necessary to make sure that every annual youth count is effective this is even more critical in the environment of COVID-19 outbreak, which exacerbated poverty and homelessness in New York City, while simultaneously producing even higher barriers to resources and services by means of fiscal deficits and the pivot to remote-based um, activities in so many areas of daily life. And yet, from 2015, when the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness mandated youth count, the citywide numbers of identified unsheltered homeless youth ranged from the low of 152 in 2016 to the high of 265 youth in 2017. These estimates stand in stark contrast to the many hundreds of unsheltered homeless youth that the providers encounter in the course of their provision of services and outreach work. Admittedly, these low numbers are in part due to HUD's restricted definition of being unsheltered. However, 
Advocates and providers also point to the youth count being under-resourced and understaffed and assigned an insufficiently low, um, high, insufficiently high priority by the DYCD, as well as being inadequately planned and methodologically weak. To address these highlighted issues and therefore ensure that runaway and homeless youth in New York City have adequate access to critical resources and services at an important developmental stage called emergent adulthood and during one of the most trying points of their lives, the following steps should be taken. One, it is imperative for the next administration to elevate youth count in particular and the issue of runaway and homeless youth in general to one of its highest priorities because when we invest in our youth, we invest in our collective better future. Two, it is necessary for the DYCD to reevaluate the resources and staffing that it allocates to youth count to ensure that the count is adequately funded and staffed with a sufficient number of people with homeless youth, specifically trauma-informed training. Three, DYCD should work to strengthen its partnership with the New York City Department of Education in the area of youth count because evidence across the nation indicates that a common factor in successful, effective youth counts is a strong collaboration with educational systems. And four, DYCD could find ways to incentivize the participation of providers and most importantly, youth as both youth count surveyors and respondents, another common factor in successful, effective youth counts. Five, DYCD could work to ensure a greater and more meaningful participation of advocates, providers, and most critically, youth who live, um, youth with lived experiences of homelessness in all stages of the youth count, planning, decision, and implementation process. Yet another factor which um, denotes effective youth counts. Six, the DYCD could elevate youth count to one of its highest priorities because the resultant numbers will influence the amount of funding allocated to an already starved sector, serving an extremely vulnerable and disproportionately traumatized population. And lastly, DYCD should work to gain greater access for youth count surveyors to indoor spaces such as abandoned buildings, 24-hour retail establishments, and hospital emergency rooms. Since an annual youth count and hope are conducted in January on one of the coldest nights of the year, when unsheltered homeless youth tend to seek refuge from the cold weather in such locations. In summation, we are here today to examine the youth counts methodology planning process, resources, and ways to improve it to capture a more accurate estimate of unsheltered homeless youth in New York City. We will also explore how youth count was adapted in the environment of COVID-19, especially given the pivot to remote base in so many areas of life. In addition, we will hear feedback and experiences of youth providers, advocates, and community members Moreover, this hearing will aim to produce a resolution calling on the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development to revise this definition of being unsheltered to reflect a multitude of homelessness experiences and survival strategies, as well as opposing the use of Youth Count 2017 estimates as a baseline for funding decisions, given that current Youth Count methodologies are still in their infancy, still in need of much refinement and considering the implications of that for the estimates accuracy. In closing, we are here today to work cooperatively to ensure that our most vulnerable youth have adequate access to critical resources and services during one of the darkest moments in their lives. I wanna thank 
the staff behind the scenes who make sure that this hearing online runs smoothly. I also would like to thank the youth committee staff for their work on this issue. My committee counsel, Amy Briggs, committee policy analyst, Anastasia Semina, financial analyst, Michelle Peregrine, and Elizabeth Arts, and a big thank you to my staff as well. Issa Cortez, Christian Ravello, Vince Grignani, and um, my chief of staff, Christine Johnson. I'd like to thank you. Um, and with that, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us today. Um, they are Council Member Lewis, Council Member Eugene, and Council Member Riley. I will now turn it over to my committee council who will review some procedural items relating to today's hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rose. I am Amy Briggs, committee counsel to the Committee on Youth Services for, for the New York City Council. I'll be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called, you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce who the next panelists will be. Council member questions will be limited to five minutes and council members, please note that this includes both your questions and the witnesses answers. Please also note that we will allow a second round of questions at today's hearing. These will be limited to two minutes, again, including both your question and the witnesses answer. For public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. I will now call on the following panel of youths with lived experiences of homelessness to testify. Alexander Perez from the Coalition for Homeless Youth Advocate and New York City Youth Action Board member, and Maddox Gorilla, Coalition for Homeless Youth Committee Coordinator and the New York City Youth Action Board Co-Coordinator. Alexander Perez, you may begin your testimony. Good morning. Um, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Alexander Ray Perez and I am a member of the NYC Youth Action Board, which is a body of young people with lived experience of homelessness that informs the work of the NYC Continuum of Care. One of the roles of the YAB is to support the Department of Youth and Community Development with the annual youth count. However, this year we limited our involvement due to concerns about the YAB's involvement in the count, as well as concerns about the overall count. I will now read the first half of the letter that the YAB sent to DYCD regarding the 2021 youth count. The New York City Continuum of Care of Care of Youth Action Board is writing to strengthen its partnership with the Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD, and to amplify the growing concerns of the youth and young adults experiencing homelessness that are members of the New York City Continuum of Care Youth Action Board regarding the annual youth count. The YAB hopes that we can work together with DYCD to resolve the ongoing issues related to the YAB's involvement and contribution to the youth count moving forward. This letter also serves as a formal notification of the YAB's decision to limit its support of the 2021 youth count to the support that the YAB has already given to the DYCD staff in charge of the count. More specifically, attending planning meetings, providing DYCD with feedback and recommendations in the summer and facilitating the provider uh, and volunteer training. Therefore, we will not be supporting with the administering of surveys as we did during 2020 youth count. Instead, we will have focused our efforts in writing this letter and providing recommendations to DYCD on how to better utilize youth with lived experience in all aspects of youth count moving forward. The YAB was established in 2017. Since its inception, it has had the honor of providing feedback and on occasion 
technical support to DYCD on the annual runway and homeless youth count. This relationship was formalized in 2019 when the YAVS contract with the NYCCOC specified supporting the youth count as one of the YAVS special project commitments. Based on the YAB's experience with the count over the past four years of partnership, the YAB saw fit to evaluate its work with the DYCD under the supervision of the Coalition for Homeless Youth and in collaboration with its stakeholders. This evaluation has found that there continues to be an opportunity for DYCD to advance its investment in authentic partnerships with young uh, people and young adults, specifically young people and young adults experiencing homelessness or houselessness not only in regards to the youth count, but also in other areas of focus by DYCD. This investment should also result in improved partnership with the YAB and a greater involvement of the YAB in the design and decision-making process of DYCD. The YAB is committed to working equitably and believes no organization is an island, that community inclusion is essential to successful programming, especially the annual youth count. Working collaboratively is not only a definition of authentic partnership, but a community-centered response to supporting the specific issues youth experiencing homelessness or houselessness to elevate regarding services. Thank you for your time. My fellow board member Maddox will finish the letter during their testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Alexander. Maddox Gorilla, you may begin your testimony. Oh, everyone, good morning. And thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Maddox Gorilla, and I am one of the coordinators of the NYC Youth Action Board. I will now resume reading the letter that the New York City YAB sent to DYCD, which includes the request and recommendations that the YAB made to DYCD that they still have not provided written response to as requested. The letter states, Given the impact the youth count has on the future of runaway and homeless youth services in New York City and nationally, the YAB is demanding that the following requests and areas of improvement are acknowledged and implemented if the city wishes to provide an accurate estimate of homeless, of homeless youth to the federal government. Number one is the youth count is being run by a single staff at DYCD with no additional funding. In addition, DYCD asks for increased YAB engagement without having resources to support the request. DYCD cannot bank off free labor from the YAB. DYCD needs to prioritize funding for the youth count and make it a priority for the agency to do a successful count. This should include a specific budget to support youth involvement in the surveying process of the count and youth involvement should not only be limited to YAP members. DYCD can, cannot keep treating the youth count as just another thing they have to do. When it should be the biggest event that DYCD Runaway Homeless Youth Unit does every year. DYCD's approach in working with youth with lived experience of homelessness is tokenizing and adultist. DYCD needs to engage in professional development to better understand what it means to work with youth for lived experience in a leadership capacity. Secondly, DYCD needs to work collaboratively with the YAB to make sure that there is a clear understanding of the YAB's role in the count, what power we have, and how DYCD will implement an equitable planning and decision-making process. DYCD consistently doesn't start planning for the count in a timely manner. This was especially true for this year since we feel that moving the count to a virtual space makes the need for better planning greater, as opposed to dedicating less time and resources, which is what was done. DYCD needs to work with the app to establish an appropriate timeline for planning the youth count. This should include quarterly youth count stakeholder meetings with the larger runaway homeless youth community, where there is a clear messaging about why the count is important and what the benefits of ensuring the count is accurate are. This will make sure the count is being developed by the community as opposed to just DYCD. Overall, DYCD needs to improve their commitment to the needs of youth experiencing homelessness in NYC. 
DYCD needs to push the youth count and other runaway homeless youth needs slash issues into their other larger programs and advocate for more resources. DYCD needs to work to strengthen their relationship with the Department of Education and other city agencies that runaway and homeless youth access. DYCD needs to prioritize public awareness of youth homelessness and the DYCD services that exist for them. Everyone know what summer youth employment is, but most people don't know what runaway homeless youth is. That is a problem that DYCD needs to address. DYCD also needs to ensure that the runaway homeless youth resor resources that are shared are accurate. If they are not accurate, they are harmful. Thank you, and I am available if you have any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Maddox. We will now turn for questions from Chair Rose. Thank you. Uh, I wanna thank you both Alexander and Maddox um, for the work that you're doing on behalf of unsheltered, unstable and sheltered youth. Um, uh, your dedication to, to the young people and, and their access to resources is, is really commendable. And um, I, I wanna thank you for your testimony today. I wanted to ask you, um, one of the one of the problems that uh, are encountered during the the um, during the youth count is that it actually happens usually on the coldest day of the year, and um, and the the surveyors are not given access to um, places where young people would probably go in order to. Um, to get out of, of the weather. So um, could you, uh, do you, can you make any recommendations on how we could have a, a more accurate youth count or, or where we need to access to, um, to be able to meet young people where they are um, in order for the count to be um, the most accurate? Yeah, I um, mean, actually, we um, in the past, we have kind of like informed, I think in the 2020 youth count, we inform areas, hot areas where we know that typically a lot of young people run away, like young people that are um, experiencing homelessness are. And in that count, we did see that we had better results. We had more um, surveys than previous year because there was involvement of people with lived experience. And we've also recommended that the count be done in the summer because we know that in the winter, people might find you know more areas to be indoors, whether those places are safe or not. Um, but we know in the summer, there's more young people because it's warmer, you know, staying out in parks, just being outside because the weather is not an issue there. So are you saying that to do the youth count in, um, in warmer, in the warmer months would actually get us a more accurate count? Yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and how would you um, incentivize young people to be both uh, surveyors and, um, and respondents in the youth count? Yeah, well, one paying young people, right? Like paying the survey, making sure that there's an adequate uh, budget for that, right? Because the, there's some, there's parts, right? It's not just administering the survey, there's the planning phase and, you know, developing the count and forming training folks to do it accurately. And also when you are meeting people on the street, we are asking young people who are experiencing homelessness to give us information. Um, so we, we should provide incentives for them. Again, in 2020, we did have incentives. Um, I work with two agencies, one agency that didn't have incentive and the other did. The one that did have incentive was uh, Streetworks yes. um, and they provided Metro cards, the options of Metro cards, of um, supermarket vouchers or gift cards. And we found that to be a success because obviously people were more um, likely to take the survey and even share with other young people to take the survey because there was an incentive involved. Um, and yes. that that was, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and that was just um, a method that was utilized by that one provider? 
Yeah, yeah, because not all, not all, although some providers do get discretionary funding, not all providers use that funding to get incentives. Some providers just use that funding to pay their staff, but not, you know, provide incentives for young people that are being surveyed. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, Alexander, were you gonna say something? Yes, no worries. I, um, and so like also it's just like the, the approach and how we look at youth experiencing homelessness. And so this is a little nuanced and a little more complicated, but you know, there is an energy of what being homeless looks like, you know, and being homeless doesn't always look like chronically on the street, you know, laid out. And I, and I think that if we look at um, how we approach helping youth in that way, then we are just missing the mark because, you know, youth, youth look like they're walking in business attire, youth look like youth look like many different walks experiencing homelessness. And to be quite frank, a lot of us are not trying to be seen. And so how do we make the system tangible? How do we make it welcoming? How do we make it so that we are looking at people in a holistic way and also getting the information out? Um, because I think also like a lot of the information is not shared that like to be counted is also uh, giving you um, and the ability to uh, claim a, a voucher. And I don't even know how that's been working now, but I, I know that a lot of this has to do with accessibility and whether or not we are truly looking or have young people represented who are counting um, that can facilitate that kind of collaboration with youth who are actually on the street um, because they're in Starbucks, they're in other places, they're, they're in a lot of places that are not just, you know, oh, I'm going to assume that this person is experiencing homelessness. Um, thank you. Um, do you uh, think that, uh, how do you think we could improve how we communicate with, um, with young people who, uh, you know, um, have this lived experience, um, you know, so that the information is, is more readily accessible, that they know, you know, where mm -hmm. they can, you know, get these services and how to access, access points. Mm -hmm. It's the visibility. I, this is the, the main um, takeaway that I've seen over and over again. It is the visibility and, and it's also just building programs and, and systems that say, hey, I see you. Making these forms so that folks who identify differently, people, people who are trans, people who are non-binary, however, and people who also represent and identify in different ways that they also feel welcome. So having that being represented in media, you know, on the trains um, and showing them how important, but also speaking to that in the systems that we provide and empowering youth experiencing homelessness and saying that you do not have to show up in just a cookie cutter way because I'm coming from a place of privilege because I can articulate myself. But a lot of the resources and innovative thinking are coming from people that we are often overlooking because we see them as needing to show up as an appropriate, an appropriate way. Yeah, and I, I would just add to, um, as, as a, one of our, of our recommendations is providing accurate resources. You know, I am always talk about this. Uh, one of my biggest pet peeves is that DYCD puts out a palm card that is inaccurate. It is saying that there are shelters that are open 24 seven that any young people can walk into at any time. And that's not accurate. Um, you know, they get away with saying that because some of those drop-ins are open to young people who are inside of them sleeping overnight for 24 hours, but is not open for a young person to receive services at three in the morning. I need to use the bathroom. I can't go to the drop-in at 120. I can't just walk into the drop-in at 125 to use the bathroom. So, you know, just updating the resources to accurately, accurately depict what services are available and what services aren't. And just investing more in the marketing and outreach. We should be marketing and outreaching like we do, you know, the TV shows so people know like uh, all of the amazing social services that are in NYC to support people even before they become homeless because we know that a lot of young people learn about services after they become homeless. 
um, over before, right? That we could be intervening before and preventing before than having them come in and being homeless after. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, your testimony was quite elucidating and, um, and, and very helpful. Uh, are, are there any questions, uh, any council members that have, would like to ask questions? Chair Rose, I, it does not appear that any of the other council members have their raise, their hands raised, but I would like to remind council members that if you do have a question, please rate for any of the particular pan panelists, please use the raised hand function in Zoom. Um, but if not, then we can move on, Chair. Okay. All right. Thank you again, um, Alexander and Maddox. Uh, thank you. And uh, we'll be speaking again after this hearing. Great. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Randy Scott, DYCD Assistant Commissioner for Vulnerable, Vulnerable and Special Needs in the Youth Division, and Tracy Thorne, RHY Director. I will deliver the oath to both of you, and after reading the oath, I will call upon each of you individually by name to respond to the oath one at a time. So please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before the, this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Assistant Commissioner Randy Scott. I do. Thank you. RHY Director Tracy Thorne. I do. Thank you, Assistant, thank you. Assistant Commissioner Scott, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair Rose and members of the Youth Services Committee. I am Randy A. Scott, Assistant Commissioner for Vulnerable and Special Needs Youth at the Department of Youth and Community Development. I am joined by Tracy Thorne, Director of Runaway and Homeless Youth Programs. On behalf of Commissioner Chong, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the city's youth count. The youth count is New York City's point in time count of homeless youth who are living on the streets, we well as living on the street as those accessing services at DYCD funded programs citywide. For almost 10 years, the youth count has been integrated with the federally mandated hope count conducted by the New York City Department of Homeless Services. These efforts have been in partnership with the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness and Departments of Housing and Urban Development, Health and Human Services and Education. An effective youth count also depends on the efforts of those on the front line supporting runaway and homeless youth. Our strong cadre of RHY providers and advocates. Their expertise has been critical in refining and improving the count every year. In the months leading up to the count, DYCD hosts a series of stakeholder planning and feedback meetings and training sessions. This year, despite our stakeholders focus on the immediate need to keep young people safe and healthy during the pandemic, they assisted in critical planning for the 2021 count, which took place on January 27th through 29th. Since 2004, through the strong commitment of the de Blasio administration and the city council, we have strengthened the runaway and homeless youth system. We have more than tripled the number of residential beds from 253 to 813, increased the age for service eligibility up to 24, and opened additional drop-in centers. There are currently eight DYCD funded centers with at least one 24 seven center operating in each of the five boroughs. In addition, young people have access to high quality uh, mental health services across the portfolio. Finally, through the New York City Unity Project, we're able to expand services to address the unique and often unmet needs of LGBTQ plus youth. Over the past few years, with the feedback from the youth count stakeholders, we have worked to refine our approach in determining where we should go to meet young people and now cover areas that include drop-in centers, residential programs, community centers, transportation hubs, public schools, 
and street outreach representatives from the youth count asked young people to complete a short, you know, short survey. The questions ask about current housing situation, age, gender identity, sexual orientation, and race. We have also expanded the time frame of the count from one day to four days, we expanded our social media campaign and strengthen outreach in our drop-in centers. We provide drop-in centers with additional funding to offer incentives for young people to complete the survey. Although we are still compiling and analyzing data from this year's count, we would like to offer some highlights of the 2020 youth count. Our planning began in May of 2019 with our first stakeholder kickoff meeting on October 17th of 2019. We included all DYCD funded operators of residential programs, drop-in centers, and street outreach. City agency partners involved ACS, DOP, DOE, Youth Action Board, and Office of the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services. Other nonprofit and advocacy organizations included the Hedrick Martins Institute, Fierce, the Coalition for Homeless Youth, and the Legal Aid Society. These efforts are supported by all members of the RHY staff who work year round to assist in the planning and execution of the count. In total, 34 organizations participated in the count and its planning. We are pleased to see that efforts resulted in the increase in total services, surveys at drop-in centers by 441. The Youth Action Board members surveyed 141 young people and were integral in the increase in the total numbers of surveys. A promising practice emerged as one of the Youth Action Board members traveled in the street outreach vein. The 2020 Youth Count Report responses from a total of 1,184 young people. The survey asked questions about where youth had spent the night over the past month in an effort to understand the transience of their homelessness. 631 youth, 53%, reported being in stable housing, including their parents or relatives' home or their own place. 498, 42%, reported unstable housing, such as a shelter or couch surfing. 44 reported unsheltered, and representatives offered them shelter at the time of the survey. And eight were outside the city. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, planning for the 2021 New York City Youth Count started in the spring of 2020. DYCD worked closely with advocates, youth action board members, providers, and other stakeholders to update survey questions and to discuss what worked and what additional steps should be taken to ensure an accurate count. These efforts were ongoing through January 2021 until the youth count began. We have already begun similar efforts for next year's count. We look forward to continuing to work with all of our partners and the council to make further improvements. Thank you once again for giving us the opportunity to discuss the youth count. We welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner Scott. RHY Director Tracy Thorne, you may begin your testimony if you have any prepared. I, I don't have any prepared at this time. I'm here to um, answer questions and support Assistant, Mr. Assistant Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Director Thorne. Chair Rose, we can now turn to you to ask for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner um, Scott. Um, it's good to see you, um, and Ms. Thorne, um, I want to, um, uh, before I go on, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Chin. Um, I, um, uh, I was uh, interested in your statement where um, you said that you um, are working on, already working on next year's count. Um, did we get the results of the 2021 count? The results of the 2021 count are being tabulated now. So that should be coming out um, shortly. Um, we... Do you have any idea, a rough idea of when we might um, have that? Usually the, um, the information comes out um, towards the end of April, early May because we work in tandem with the um, Department of Homeless Services. Okay, okay, thank you. 
Um, could you tell me what the current level of staffing and funding um, that's dedicated to youth count and um, and what is the specific budget um, uh, presently committed for youth count? So basically, typically um, it's two youth count coordinators that are dedicated to the youth count, which comes from AOTPS funding. So another other than personnel services. And um, out with, in addition to those two youth count coordinators, we have the RHY staff, which consists of 12 um, staff members. And in assistance of the youth count, we have different staff from our ACO division, our fiscal division, um, our legal division that assist in uh, making sure that the youth count um, is rolled out in the proper way. So in total, we, we have the two youth count coordinators that come from AOTPS funding. And we have our RHY staff folks. And then we have um, some dedicated staff from other divisions within RHY that assist with youth count. Um, and so uh, could you tell me, um, so you have 12 other RHY staff members. Are they um, actively um, engaged in, in the youth count? Um, can you tell me what what their role is in, uh, in the youth count? Sure, great. Thanks for the question. One of the um, things I want to point out is that currently we have two program managers who, who were actually youth count coordinators in previous um, youth count years who we hired to become full-time program managers. Um, so what happens during the time that we start the youth count, which is usually the May um, after the reporting and everything comes out of the previous year up until um, the next April. So in May of, so for example, of May of 2021, we'll be planning for next year. So what happens is staff get together, we talk about the um, positives and things of how the count went and ways that we can make sure that we put the information out. We start scheduling, we put together the necessary um, times that we wanna have stakeholder meetings, when we wanna have different um, conversations with those stakeholders, when we wanna talk to internal um, assistance from our IT division, from our legal division, and so on. So the program managers that work, or the staff in RHY that work on um, youth count, usually in our weekly um, RHY team meetings, this is a dedicated item on that, um, that agenda where we talk about how we're going to put out the efforts and who, what role people will play from participating in meetings, to working with IT, to working with legal. So everyone takes a, a piece of the puzzle, as they may say, and does their part in making sure that the youth count is um, put out there. And that effort is led by um, the director, Tracy Thorne. So she leads it, then she has our deputy directors who work with her, and then the program managers work with the deputy directors based on what information or steps need to be taken. Um, do you feel that uh, that that's uh, at, that the staffing level is adequate and um, and resourced uh, at a level that you know helps with the efficacy of, of the count? Mm -hmm. well, over the years, and you know, I've been with DY City for about eleven years now, and I've done almost every I've done every youth count that we we've, we've put out, and from the very first one where we only had six providers that participated to now where we have this um, bigger system of um, participants and stakeholders, I feel that the staff have definitely uh, put a lot in, in terms of the services and the work necessary for youth count. Mm -hmm. So we've evolved the youth count in regards to participants. We've involved the youth count in, in terms of locations. We've involved the youth count in terms of the survey that's being asked. We involved the youth count in terms of the way we connect with um, DHS. So I think right now we, we've done a great job. Is there room for improvement? Of course. And we look forward to working with the stakeholders that are involved to make sure that we continue to improve this um, youth count every year that we do it. So um, you're saying, um, how long is the planning, the planning stages? Uh, how, you know, sort of what is the timeline mm -hmm. that you put into planning um, for the youth count annually? So the youth, thanks for the question. So the youth count starts May 
Um, so for example, for next year's youth count, we will be starting in May. So we will close out the um, 2021 youth count. And for the 2022 youth count, we will start in May of 2021. And that carries over into April of 2022. So it's usually May 20 of 20, whatever year to April of the next year. And that's the planning um, timeline for youth count. Do you think so that you have, I'm sorry, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I'm saying so basically it's almost a year of planning, but go ahead, sorry. Okay. Do you think that um, you have adequate staff or um, that you need additional staffing and resources? Um, for to do the count? If, if, if folks, for the work that we're doing, I think we're doing a great job. And I, I give kudos to the staff, you know, from the 12 RHY staff to the two youth count coordinators and to the extended staff that assist us, we did a great job is being done. Um, we, if folks, if there's a comparison of the youth count to hope count, then I think that's a different discussion that needs to be had. But in regards to what the efforts are being put forth for the youth count, I think there's being a great job is being done by the, the 14 or more staff that participate. Um, have you made any efforts to strengthen the youth count methodology that you've used? Yes, we past? have. Yes, we have. And that speaks to what I was sharing before in terms of the first youth count where we had um, only seven providers and we didn't have a true methodology. Over the course of the next youth count years, we work with folks like the YAB, we work with stakeholders that um, are on the ground doing the work to make sure that a methodology was in place. And um, that methodology was accepted by all of the stakeholders um, at that time. The methodology is something that's an evolving um, document or evolving words based on what's happening at the time. So there's always room and that's where the stakeholder meetings come into play where methodology can be improved, changed to make sure it represents what's currently happening at the time. Um, what issues have you encountered during the planning design and implementation process, you know, of the recently for the youth count? In respect to the, to the pandemic, youth, um, yeah. um, uh, in respect to COVID nineteen, but also, you know, in general, you know, what were some of the issues that you've encountered um, that in in the planning and design and implementation? Thanks for the question. Some of the um, concerns that were brought to the table were um, who was involved, because in the early um, beginnings, we did not have our sister agencies like the Department of Education. Um, we did not have certain provider, um, provider agencies at the table. We didn't have the Department of Probation um, at the table. So we brought these individuals to the table to make sure that we captured all of the different locations where we could survey youth who fell into the unsheltered, possible unsheltered category. So we made sure we did that. Other things that we did was the locations that we went to. We, in, we included many additional um, locations with the assistance from the YAB in terms of helping us identify where those locations were so that folks who were um, doing the surveys, especially our street outreach teams, could go to those locations and make sure that they surveyed um, youth. Um, we also looked at, in terms of the process, we hired, like I said before, the two youth count coordinators who were doing the work before to become part of our um, team so that we made sure that we had the experience, expertise on hand of making sure that there was no drop in how we um, ran that youth count. And with respect to the um, pandemic, we followed the guidance that was set by the city and the state and CDC in respect to making sure that we, we put out a youth count that was safe um, and one that could still get the bottom line um, taken care of. Um, uh, what efforts have you made to um, improve, um, uh, to strengthen DYCD's partnership with the Department of Education um, to increase you know, the youth count's effectiveness and accuracy? Um, because right now it, it it seems that uh, it's a bit tenuous. Can you 
Can you talk to me about uh, your, you know, the relationship with DOE, how you, you know, engage them and, you know, and if you are satisfied with the, the results? Mm -hmm. we, we've engaged DOE in many ways. One, not only for youth count, but in other RHY services. So we work closely with the Students in Temporary Housing Division of DOE, as well as District 79. Um, two areas that um, work with homeless youth and families. So basically we um, made sure that we had regular meetings with the staff over at DOE on that, making sure that they were aware um, of the youth count and what the expectations of the youth count were. We had discussions on the role that we would love for them to play, and especially with having their staff survey youth um, within their programs. And we you know, made sure that they participated in our stakeholder meetings. It's, it's a great partnership. It's something that we're continuing to improve each year due to services. And recently we just put out, a, uh, we work with them and some of our other city agencies to put out a benefits navigator for um, around housing and homelessness, which is available online for people to um, access. So these are some of the, um, the ways that we've continued to work with DOE along with some of our other sister agencies like ACS, um, DSS, HRA, DHS, in terms of making sure that we all are talking to each other. Um, does every school participate? Um, I would assume that you, you're looking at middle school and high school. Does every school in um, the system participate? Does um, each of the schools that do participate uh, or do each of the schools have an identified person that um, that you know is accountable for 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 doing the survey how do you how do you you know actually determine who's doing you know the survey if if every school is doing the survey and how you you go you, know, you get the you get the right. information we, we we do have the key um, partners who we communicate with, who then work with their staff to do um, the various surveys at the sites that are identified. Um, I'm going to ask Tracy Thorne to come off mute and share in terms of her relationship of building that um, DOE system so that youth can get um, surveyed. Thanks, Randy. Um, yeah, we've been working with the Department of Education. Uh, we, we worked with the community schools to do surveys, and we work with District 79. And since the restructuring with um, students in temporary housing, we've been, like Randy said, we've been really working closely with them. Um, and the, to, to establish the, the type of contacts that you're talking about in the schools um, in order to do all the surveying. So, we're really hopeful for um, this next this next round of youth count to have the opportunity to work closely with them um, for the 2022 youth count. So, um, so all of the schools do not participate in in the youth count. Yeah, Is we're starting we're starting with the natural with natural fits for people who. Um, definitely understand the needs of young people who are experiencing homelessness, who understand that a lot of the young people that are, are the students that they work with are experiencing homelessness or may experience homelessness. Um, so we, we are able to do a proactive approach and also, you know, part of, and also work with young people who are experiencing homelessness, who need extra supports. Part of the youth count, a really major part of the youth count is connecting young people to services, making sure young people in the schools know that we're here, that we're able to support them, and that, um, and, and youth count really helps promote those activities. And so it's kind of a multi-prong, you know, we're working in partnership, you know, citywide, like Randy described, we are working with people to raise awareness about our services, and we want the schools to participate in youth count. How many schools then are you are you actually working with then that participates it's, in the survey? We're gonna um, we're working with the uh, students in temporary housing schools, the district seventy nine nine schools. We're gonna uh, focus on, that, on them for this year, yeah. So, and then expand later, perhaps, yeah. So, are you dealing with schools outside of district seventy nine? 
Um, not, not at this time, but we could not at this time though. So, um, is that representative of all five boroughs? The district 79? There's, yeah, five there's schools now. in all five boroughs. Yes, yes. Um, and so you talked about outreach. Um, I'm really interested in that. You know, how how is, uh, what does the outreach look like? How is the youth count, you know, marketed? And um, how do we let people know? And, and what, what's the resource stream to do this? Um, how much funding is attributed for, um, for outreach and, um, and advertisement, marketing, um, the, mm -hmm. the website, all of, you know, all of the ways that well, you try to reach? Yeah, well, each, each year we, we, we look to improve how we do our outreach. And um, over the years, we've done outreach through our, as you know, DYCD has a very prevalent um, social media um, system where we um, work with Instagram, Facebook, um, and all of those different social media places where youth tend to go. We also have um, palm cards, electronic palm cards is something that we've um, done a, a recently to make sure that people are aware. We've created flyers, we've created posters that have gone up at our various sites to speak to the, um, the youth count. And we've also shared it electronically with our um, stakeholders so that they can put it up at their particular sites. We've used the, um, the Lynx kiosks to uh, make sure that we promote information on youth count. Um, we have brochures that we've given out and we basically just make sure that we use these and word of mouth is always one of the best tools to get the information out there. So those are some of the areas of how we've done it um, with respect to the youth count, as well as during the um, time of the youth count, we give out promotional items such as bags or hats that have the logo um, that you know the YAB and um, helped us create so that we can make sure that folks are wearing hats, carrying bags, and that people ask questions about what does that mean, I count, or they can um, share the, the, the messaging around it, as well as give information on how a youth can be um, surveyed. Um, what is your budget for that? Do you have a, a separate budget line for that? It, 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 var it, it varies year to year. Um, as earlier mentioned, we have an AT AOTPS budget that is used for youth count. So um, we basically look at the number of providers, um, stakeholders involved, and then we purchase things um, based on that number. So it can, it can definitely vary in terms of how much we put. I can't put an exact dollar figure to it based on the, um, the number of participants and stakeholders that we have involved. But. So it's basically um, predicated on whatever the, the count, the previous count, sort of the numbers that you got from the previous count. So well, not, not, not the numbers from the previous count. Um, we basically look at the number of participants um, involved in the count because, you know, we're looking at, you know, for our drop-in centers alone, they service 14,400 youth in a given year. Our crisis services program service 3,000 plus youth in a given year. And our TILs service 1,000 youth in a given year, right? So we look at those numbers, plus we look at the possibility of what numbers um, our partners at DOP have, our partners at ACS have, our departments at, um, you know, some of the advocacy agencies and some of the provider agencies so that each um, program can have enough of these incentives and um, supplies in order to give out to youth that they may survey or that may come into their program. So the number, like I said, it, it can range from anywhere from 10,000 um, in terms of the items that we purchase to give out and that number changes. And we work with our internal department, um, our PPI department on a lot of our imaging and, um, you know, the promotional information that goes out like flyers and um, posters, and they put together that information for us. So that's an expense that is an in-kind expense versus something that we pay for. 
do you make um, incentives uh, available for the providers that are participating in, in the count? Um, and uh, are there um, incentives for young people to, to participate as surveyors in, in the process? Yes, um, each, each stakeholder, um, especially when we do our training in regards to the volunteers that will go out to conduct surveys, each of them are given the items which they bring to the sites that they are scheduled to go to. So if I'm scheduled to come to City Hall to do surveys, then I'm coming to City Hall with the necessary items that I would give to the youth who would complete the surveys. One of the things that we've done um, in kind as well is we've provided micro purchases to our um, drop-in centers where they're able to use this funding to hire youth to conduct a survey as well as provide um, additional incentives for um, youth that participate in the survey. Um, so that has been done in the past in regards to how um, the providers use that funding in order to make sure that the surveys, the surveys happen during youth count. Okay. Um, uh, one more question because I know my committee members, you know, have some questions for you also, but I, I just would like to know um, the um, Alexander and Maddox, you know, mentioned that the letter was written to DYCD um, and um, that there's been no response. Have you reviewed this letter? Have you um, considered the recommendations and um, and maybe changes to methodology that was um, or recommended um, by uh, the, the um, I think it was the YAV. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're always delighted to hear from the young people, especially the Youth Action Board, about their experiences um, and important insight. Um, you know, we're dedicated to continuing the work with them. And in respect to the, the question about the, the letter, we are aware of the letter. Um, a response was um, sent to the YAB from our Deputy Commissioner, Susan Haskell. Uh, to schedule a meeting with the YAB in order to address all of the concerns that were identified in the letter. Um, that meeting um, was canceled by the YAB, but we're still um, willing to meet with them to discuss the issues and to move um, forward together in making sure that the youth count um, is best for all that need um, this particular benefit and service. I would like to be um, invited to that meeting when it when it does happen. Sure. Um, and um, uh, I, I'm going to open the floor to my colleagues. Uh, I'm going to circle back for a second round. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on council members in the order in which they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including the time for the witnesses' responses. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. We will now hear questions from Council Member Chin. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. To Chair Rose, I just jumped off on from another <laughs> committee hearing on housing and immigration, and I said, I don't want to miss the youth hearing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, thank you for the testimony. I was able to catch uh, part of it. Um, so my question is that, I know that you talk about, you know, through the survey and through the youth camp, uh, you provide, um, you connect the uh, youth, you know, to services. And so I wanted to, sort of like connect that to the budget and also the need, right? Um, I know that um, Director Thorne is here, homeless and runaway youth. And I know that this committee has advocated for the increased number of homeless and runaway youth beds from the beginning, all right? Beginning of uh, my tenure on the council and also council on the road. So looking at you know, information that you're able to gather uh, from these surveys in terms of youth that are on unstable housing or youth that was uh, homeless on the street. How are you using those information um, to advocate for an increased, you know, numbers of um, 
services and also increased number of, of beds for homeless and runaway youth. I mean, we've also heard from uh, youth in foster care uh, that are aging out of foster care. So there's a tremendous need out there. So how do you use this information and really transfer it to like fighting for more resources? Thank you for your question, um, Councilwoman Jen. And we, what we do internally is we um, analyze the information, not only the youth count, but information that comes from other um, sources. Um, as you know, there's some local laws out that um, we're required to submit some information on, especially demographics. So we look at that information and we say, okay, what, where are we now in terms of um, making sure that one, awareness is available for all youth who are in need, which we feel can be satisfied at this particular point in time. Um, we have 813 beds, which um, basically, as you know, is uh, 560 additional beds that were added during this administration. Um, with, so what we're looking to do is make sure that youth are aware of these services and come to the proper um, places to get it. We've you know, added five 24 hour drop-in centers so youth can have access to services around the clock and get the necessary need that they have um, to make sure that that happens. We've um, created a new system, our PTS system, which tracks this information and gives real time information, but we always ask that our providers continue to communicate with, with themselves um, to make sure that youth are in need. Over the last two reports that we've submitted for um, shelter access in terms of youth who were turned away, there were no youth that were turned away from needing or requiring a bed um, because of the fact that there are so many additional beds online from previous years. Uh, and beds include, you know, the 753 for um, 16 to 20 and the 60 for 21 to 24. So we, we feel that at this time, you know, if a youth is in need of any particular services, whether it's case management, whether it's mental health, housing, employment, uh, basic life skills, such as legal and immigration services, those services can be rendered at um, sites at um, currently and satisfy the need. Just remind us, are the drop-in center in every single borough? Yes, a 24 hour drop Yes, yeah, so 24 hours. We have eight drop in centers in total. Five of them are 24 hours, one in each borough, through an investment from um, the union project. And but for the homeless and runaway youth, I, I don't remember an additional budget uh, in the preliminary budget uh, in terms of for additional beds. So do you see that being changed in, in the budget? Because there is still a tremendous need out there. Um, 813 sounds good, but it really sounds very minimal compared to the needs out there. Uh, so are there push to increase budget to, so that we can increase more bed before the end of this administration? I think we plan to do that, right, Chair? <laughs> I believe as um, our commissioner um, stated, you know, if the funding has becomes available, we are willing to make sure that um, programs are I'm put on, um, should I stop speaking or no, no, answer. Yeah. Okay, so um, are willing to be put online. You know, currently we have beds that are vacant every given night in high numbers. So we feel that uh, there is a service um, where we can, you know, assist any youth in need at this given time. That's a surprise that you have vacant beds? Every night. Over a hundred. Wow, that's something. Not, something is not right out there. Yeah, I think we need <laughs> to talk with the providers and see what's going on. Because I remember other hearings when we were advocating for additional beds um, that you know use were being turned away. So we need to get to the bottom of that. I mean that that is definitely um, something that I didn't expect. Yeah. And from the Thank reports. You, from the reports that we submit to you, the, the last two reports showed there were no youth who were turned away. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member um, Chen. I, you know, I just want to kind of drill down on that. Uh, Council Member Chen um, 
brings up a good point. Um, from from what we we know or what we see and experience, um, the numbers seem to be quite high. And uh, in the past, we haven't been able to to meet the need. Um, so could this be attributable to the fact that um, the information is not getting out there, that they're not, um, they don't know that these resources are available, um, how to access them. Mm -hmm. um, again, um, you know, I go back to um, Alexander's point that, you know, the marketing of, of, of these programs, um, is it, is it, it sounds like maybe it might, might, might not be sufficient um, if, if, you know, if we have empty beds and clearly uh, you can see that there's, you know, there's a, a need, so. There is communication. Um, Tracy sends out an email daily um, to the providers with respect to the numbers um, so that they are very clear. They also know the numbers because they have access to our, um, participant tracking system, which captures this information, as well as they communicate with one another um, in regards to vacancies that they may have. And our, our providers, you know, do a great job in, in communicating um, externally. However, we got to remember that, you know, sometimes with the pandemic, certain avenues that they were used to um, communicating with may not be at um, full capacity. So sometimes they have to think of um, other ways to get the information out. And as all of you know, our residential programs are confidential locations. So they can't broadcast, they can't promote these sites and say, hey, I have 20 beds vacant um, at such and such address due to the fact that we have to keep them confidential um, for the sake of the youth in service. So it's a matter of making sure that they communicate with local um, places in their community so that they understand that, hey, if you come in contact with a youth who's in um, need of housing, we're a resource, give us a call, things like that. So what our providers have done um, a, a great job in making sure that they continue to do that. We work with them around that and it's being monitored. We monitor them on that as well. It sounds to me like you might need to um, engage young people in some kind of creative um, marketing where um, the word will, will get out. Um, I'm assuming then that uh, since you can't give the location of, of these, uh, the, the housing that um, they then go through uh, your, your dashboard through your website. Um, but then there might need to be, you know, more attention paid to you know, um, specifying this population and how they can access, you know, housing through, through, you know, your existing, um, you know, routes to get there. But um, it sounds like you, you need, there, there needs to be an active marketing campaign on subways and, and places where they frequent because, um, uh, and, and, and that and that's something that we're doing with our drop-ins because those locations are um, available for to be known in the community. So we're working closely with our drop-in centers to make sure that that happens so that people know they can go to, that'd be the first place that they should go to outside of our street outreach to get the assistance of any um, housing that they may, they may need. So we definitely um, have regular communications with our drop-in centers. We um, work with them on the planning and outreach that they have, which is a, a, a component of their contract. And we make sure that they are using their staff to the best of their ability to make sure that that messaging is getting out there. And um, as I stated before, we do use um, our social media um, campaign and kiosks to make sure that our outreach, our outreach and our um, drop-in centers are, are known to folks. And they get the e-blast, they get the, um, the newsletter that is sent, um, and we also do it through presentations. Um, the staff, RHY staff, does presentations to various stakeholders to make sure that they are aware of this particular service. I recently just did a conference with DOE for a two-day conference where I spoke about RHY, the services that we, um, we had. And, you know, it's a matter of making sure that the information trickles down. 
to folks on the ground who are working with it. So those are the streams of ways that we're definitely making sure that the messaging is out there. Do the um, providers have a dedicated budget line for um, for outreach and, and marketing? Um, and if not, uh, do you think it's something that we should, mm -hmm. I think it's something we should consider um it shouldn't come out of just their general operating funds well each of the um the the sites the drop-ins especially identify to us what their budgets will be um how what the makeup will be but they do knowing that outreach is a, a key responsibility of their contract they do um set aside funding for that specific person um purpose you know whether it's done um outreach or whether it's done through program line or whether it's done through the client line, but that's something that our, um, our providers, contractor providers do, yes. I, I think it should be um, sort of a mandated part of the contracts, uh, each contract, uh, since it's so important, since an accurate count um, is so important to us being able to provide the necessary resources and mm -hmm. if, you know, if we're undercounting, we're not going to be able to provide the funds needed for, you know, to meet the need. So um, it, it's really an important thing. And I would hope that we, um, this committee would, you know, hear from you about um, the need, but, you know, a budgetary, a budgetary need, um, because we want to be able to meet meet that. Um, and, and in terms of that, when we have a, a, a count that might be um, an undercount, um, this year, there's going to be a big turnover in, in all of the administration, council members and the mayor, you know, what are we doing to, um, to ensure the continuity with the new um, administration in this area and you know what our efforts are being made to ensure the availability of accurate estimates of homeless youth population for the new administration so that we don't lose any ground mm -hmm. well basically um what we're doing we're going to continue the work um going forward with the new administration we're going to keep doing um and growing from what we're doing so the count will continue um in january and we will basically monitor and look at how we can continue to grow this, this particular service. Um, it's been an integral part of RHY for the last few years, and I don't see it as disappearing um, at this present time. Um, so basically, we're going to make sure that this is communicated in the same channels that we've always communicated. So I share it with my supervisor, my supervisor shares it up, and then I'm sure our commissioner will um, speak to what the, the work is being done within the um, agency. Um, are RHY providers contractually obligated to participate in youth count and to what extent? And um, are, they, uh, are they permitted to opt out or limit their, you know, their support or participation in the youth count? We, we communicate with our providers on the expectations of their participation in the youth count. Um, as I stated in the very first youth count, it was only the drop-ins that participated. But since then, we've included all of our contracted RHY services and they understand, they, they get um, you know, the expectations of what the dates, the trainings, what their role will be, um, how they would complete the survey, coming in and signing for the um, necessary tablets or information that they will be um, receiving. And this is something that we will be looking um, forward to when we release a new RFP to make sure that it's um, stated in that RFP. Um, and what uh, youth homelessness specific training is provided uh, youth count staff and is it trauma informed training? Yes, we, we have training all throughout the year. And it's not specific just to youth count. It's specific to um, what's happening in the world and doing the work. So we work heavily with um, Vibrant 
um, which used to be the Mental Health Association of New York, and making sure that you know training is available. As you know, we have our Healing the Hurt conference that we, we, we do yearly. We didn't have it last year due to the pandemic. Um, we also are looking at various issues around mental health and uh, managing that because things happen at sites and we need to make sure that we're readily available to assist our providers in terms of any mental health needs that they have. And as you know, we have um, funding that is provided to all of our um, contracted providers around mental health services so that they're able to hire the necessary staff, they're able to um, have the necessary mental health services available to um, youth as well as their staff. Um, and, and just sorry to cut you off, but mental health is one of the key components of um, key indicators that our providers work on within um, their, their, their sites. Okay. Um, what is, um, are there any efforts that you're making now to, um, to review um, youth count and, um, and your procedures, the process and efficacy and um, the methodology? Uh, what, what are you doing? You know, are you doing and making any efforts in those areas now? Um, and um, yeah, are you, are you doing it? <laughs> yes, we are. Um, normally, like I said, with the process, it's from May to April of the following year. So what happens is usually after we are able to put all the um, information and numbers together, we then process that. We um, pass it off to our sister agency, DHS, for the full report that is sent to HUD. And then we then start the process all over again and looking at what transpired the year in the account prior, looking at the trends, looking at the um, the, the highs, looking at the lows, looking at who we could possibly um, include in the upcoming um, um, youth count, looking at how we can get the, the YAB involved or um, seeing how we can work with them more closely. So those are things that we start to do in May of the given year so that we can make sure that by the time January comes, it's um, a well thought and put in place process. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there's no plans to ask for more beds or, or increased resources at this time. Um, that's not a discussion that I've, that I've currently had or been um, party to, but I will definitely bring that question back to um, the agency heads and see where we are in that process. Um, I'm, I'm, I have no more questions. Um, is, um, oh, uh, are there any council members that would like to ask a question? So at this time, I believe we've concluded our first round of questions. Um, if you would like to ask a second round of questions, please keep your questions to two minutes and the Sergeant of Arms will keep a timer and we'll let you know when your time is up. It looks like we have a raised hand from council member Chin. So we will now hear questions from council member Chin. Time starts now. Thank you. I just want to have a follow-up question. Um, since I just, you know, came from the uh, the Immigration and Housing Committee, uh, do you have a breakdown or like specific um, services or um, the housing that's targeted to assist immigrant youth? Uh, I know that we have fought for bed, you know, for LGBT youth. Um, are there outreach and, and um, you know, focus on the immigrant youth that's out there that, that do need this type of support. There, to, to get, and I had um, stated this earlier, earlier, but there's five key indicators that um, RHY contractors focus on. Um, there's housing, there's employment, there's mental health, there is, um, what am I missing? Housing, employment, mental health, education. And then the fifth one is basic life skills, which focuses on legal services and or immigration services or any other um, services that don't fit in the other four. The only criteria for our programming in regards to um, the drop-in centers as well as residential is age. So if an immigrant should need services at any if I, at our drop-in or should need housing at one of our residential programs, as long as they meet the age criteria, they're eligible for that service. Once they get into that program, 
then our um, seasoned and um, providers work with that particular youth in getting the necessary um, resources or benefits that they should require in order to re regain, re get their independence. So basically- the Are there any like, mm -hmm. it's, it's age, yeah. But are there any partnership with the mayor's office of um, immigrant affair to really get the information out there to the immigrant community that this yeah. resource is available? Yes, thanks for that question because there is one, there's a local law out there that requires us to work with Moya um, and have training twice a year. And we recently just had a training last week with Moya where they um, came to our provider meeting and shared um, updated information and um, resources with our providers on how to work with immigrants. So that is something that's embedded in our services. And, um, you know, we, like I said, we had a, a nice tra training last week with um, Moya officials. Yeah, I think it'll be also good to have um, like a number if we have, you know, in terms of immigrant youth or undocumented immigrant youth that are serviced uh, by the this program or, or they are in um, the homeless and that they are utilizing the runaway and, and homeless youth bed uh, and the services in the drop-in center. I think that, that would be good to know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like at this time we have concluded the second round of questions. Um, Chair Rose, we will now turn to you for any closing remarks before the administration is excused. Chair, you're on mute. Chair, you're muted again. Sorry. Would you mind repeating that? Apologies, I think you're, oh, no. We're having technical difficulties here. Chair, would you like me to continue or would you like to? All right. <laughs> it's okay. So I think we're going to move on to the public panel until a while the chair resolves her technical difficulties. But for the public testimony, I will call up individuals in panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For a public panelist, once I call your name, a member of your staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief minute moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce you and that you may begin before starting your testimony. The public panelists will be in the following order. Pascal La Rosilière from Good Shepherd Services, Ray Raymond Leclerc from New Alternatives, and Jamie Paulovich from the Coalition for Homeless Youth. Pascal LaRosilière, La you may begin your testimony now. Time starts now. Hello, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'd like to ask if there's an opportunity to go to the next uh, panelist um, because I'm having a hard time pulling up uh, my current testimony. Is that possible? Not a problem. We'll, we'll turn to you after the next panelist. So Ra Ramon Leclerc, you may begin your testimony. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Um, I want to say that I am. Um, I found a lot of inaccuracies in Mr. Um, in the testimony from DYCD. He stated that no one is turned away. I don't know if he is not taking into account the um, LGBTQ population because every night I sit in the office at New Alternative and watch my director, Kate Barnhart, make phone calls to RHY housing providers and our clients are turned away. And also the, the number of 15 homeless youth on the street 
is totally inaccurate. We see a population of about 50 homeless youth who are currently living on the streets who all identify as LGBTQ on a weekly basis. So I don't know who DYCD is talking to, and I'm sorry, I'm frustrated, but um, yeah, the, they need, there needs to be a better way to make sure everybody is counted. Cause these counts just seem like they're only going to areas of privilege or whatever, but I know for a fact that these numbers are not accurate. I'll really give the rest of my time. Thank you for your testimony, Ramon. I will now turn to Jamie Pavlovich to testify. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Jamie Polovich, and I'm the executive director of the Coalition for Homeless Youth. I'd like to thank Chair Rose for holding today's hearing and for the council's ongoing support of youth experiencing homelessness in New York City. I will be submitting longer testimony outlining the history of the youth count, but during my time today, I will focus on our recommendations regarding the count and will add that we strongly support everything that has already been stated by the Youth Action Board. I would also like to state that there were many things stated during the testimony of the administration that we would categorize as not true or extremely misleading that we will expand on as well in our written testimony. However, their testimony does highlight how there continues to be an unfortunate disconnect between what is really happening and what they want to portray as happening regarding services for youth experiencing homelessness in this city. I would also like to specifically respond to what Assistant Commissioner Scott said regarding the YAB letter, since the YAB has already testified. I am personally the provider ally for the New York City Youth Action Board and someone who was personally CC'd on all correspondences. Com Assistant Commissioner's spot response to the chair's question is not true and extremely concerning. The New York City Youth Action Board explicitly asked for a response to their letter in writing, which Maddox previously testified to. And to date, DYCD has not responded to them in writing. The YAB has never scheduled nor canceled a meeting. Regarding the youth count, it is imperative that we have an accurate estimate of homeless youth in New York City, given the power such numbers play and the resources provided for this extremely vulnerable and often invisible population. Systematic undercounts of street homeless youth only support systematic under-resourcing to providers and a lack of needed services to our youth. Our recommendations are as follows, and I apologize in advance, I know I won't get through them all. Um, number one, the city must provide adequate funding for the youth count. The last funded youth count that was conducted in New York City was funded by city council in 2007 and 2008 and was championed by the late councilman Lou Fiddler. This count is now over a decade old, but is still the number that is most often quoted by providers and advocates. We greatly appreciate the council, specifically Speaker Johnson, for including the need for a comprehensive youth count in his 2020 case for change report. However, minus adequate funding, it will not produce accurate results. Number two. Although the city must only use the numbers of youth that meet the HUD definition found during the youth count as a part of their point in time numbers, DYCD has the ability to use the larger, more accurate numbers from the count when they talk about the population size locally. We know that HUD's definition is extremely narrow and often does not capture the many ways in which youth experience homelessness. By okay. DYCD only quoting numbers that align with the HUD definition, they are misrepresenting not only the the amount of youth experiencing homelessness in New York City, but those youths lived reality. Number three, they must increase the youth involvement in all aspects of the count. Homeless youth are the experts when it comes to their own experiences and their voices should be at the forefront of the count planning, implementation and recommendation phases of the process. And they should be given a monetary stipend for their time. 
Number four, in 2019, DYCD took over all aspects of the count from CIDI. Since that time, it has been understaffed and we have seen a significant delay in the release of the findings from the count. Hence, the 2020 report has still not been released. Therefore, we recommend that DYCD ensure that the oversight of the count is adequately staffed, including by youth with lived experience, that they start planning for the next year's count as soon as the current year's count concludes, and that they ensure that the youth count reports are completed in a timely manner so that they can be made available as soon as HUD releases that year's PIT data. Number five, the city needs to ensure that the DOE participates in the count. A common factor in the success of youth counts across this country has been establishing a strong collaboration and commitment from the educational systems. Although this is something that DYCD commits to doing every single year, they do not initiate the process in time to ensure a successful collaboration given the DOE's IRB requirements. Number six, the count needs to be incentivized. Youth must be compensated for participating in a survey. This is a financial burden that should not be responsible of the volunteering agencies and should be provided by DYCD. Number seven, the city should invest in a PSA campaign for the next year's count. The PSA would increase the outreach to youth with, that need services and need to be counted as well as bring attention to the homeless youth epidemic with the general public. Number eight, the count sites need to be established through all five boroughs to make sure we are adequately reaching youth no matter where they are. And number 10, that the city needs to utilize and recruit, um, needs to recruit and utilize a larger number of volunteers to assist with the count. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now turn to Pascal Lorizillier, if you're available. Time starts now. Yes, thank you for this opportunity. I must apologize. I'm having some technical issues with the file um, and we will have to submit our testimony in writing. So at this moment, I'd like to relinquish the rest of my time. Thank you, thank you for your time and we, we will I will now turn to Chair Rose for questions. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Can you? Yeah, yes. I, I have to apologize. I, I don't know what happened. It just said the microphone no longer existed. So I'm sorry. Um, I, I wanna thank our panelists, um, uh, our advocates and providers. Uh, um, I'd like to know, um, in your opinion, what level of staffing and funding do you think is needed for DYCD and for the providers to ensure an effective and accurate youth count? I don't, is that question for yeah, anyone? For, for? Yeah, um, anyone who would like to, to take it on. Do you think there should be a dedicated um, budget line for um, the youth count and, um, and dedicated staffing? And, and what would that look like in order to ensure that we get an accurate youth count? Well, I think speaking from the coalition, I think that when we talk about youth counts, we should talk about it in two different lenses. I think that once that one, there's the obligation to the to the point in time and hope count that we need to do um, per HUD, right? And so I think that that's one support that the providers need is an assessment of what staffing and volunteer um, capacity they would need to be able to produce adequate numbers uh, during the youth count the consecutive days after the larger hope count to send those numbers to HUD. But I think also equally as important and one of the things that I know that Speaker Johnson outlined in the case for change report is the need for New York City to conduct another separate comprehensive youth count that really goes above and beyond what's already allowed by the limited uh, perimeters that HUD sets forth. And so I think regarding staffing and budget for that count, you're talking about a, a lot more need for increased staffing, obviously, to conduct a count of that magnitude, plus a budget, right? Because 
ideally account like that would be done alongside a formal research entity and wouldn't be overseen by the, the DYCD. For example, the 20, uh, 2007 count that council funded was done by the Coalition for Homeless Youth. It was not done by DYCD. Okay, thank you. Um, um, it, it, I'm sorry, in, in addition, I feel like each provider should be able to provide their own count because I feel like the numbers that DYCD presented were very under and misrepresented by various populations. I don't have access to see, you know, a breakdown of, you know, LGBT, foster care, but I feel like there are some real disproportionately huge numbers for them to have such low numbers. Um, so I feel like each provider should maybe have their own count and submit their counts to either DYCD or the city council itself. Thank you. Um, in your experience, do you think there's a gap between the currently available RHY beds and the needed RHY beds? Yes. Yes. I do. Um, like um, DYCD stated that there were no open, I mean, that there were over 100 open beds on any given night. Mm -hmm. I have sat in the office and watched my director, Kate Barnhart, on the phone with either Ali Fournay or other providers who, who are on the DYCD list, and they say they have nothing. So I don't know where they're getting their facts from. I mean, I don't know if it's because we're targeting LGBT specific beds or not, but we keep hearing no. So I want to know where, where's the, you know, <laughs> where are their numbers coming from as per providers of like our experiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think to add, I think Ramon raises a really great point. I think that when we look at beds for homeless youth, we can't look at just numbers of beds that are needed, but what kinds of beds are needed. And I think that that's one of the biggest um, the biggest uh, downsides to the runaway and homeless youth shelter system is that it wasn't it wasn't built intentionally around the needs of young people, right? We know that there are young people, not all young people are the same. And so not all services should be the same. And I think that there's a lot of unique things in the runaway and homeless youth system that, and we shouldn't conform to the way the DHS system does things. But I think that one of the things that DHS does that DUICD doesn't do is that after individuals go through the assessment period in the adult shelter system, they can be streamlined into more specialized services. And despite our constant advocacy with DYCD to create things like, like, for example, mental health specific tills or crisis programs for young people experiencing homelessness, they continue to only contract services um, blindly, quite frankly, uh, just based on, you know, overall population demographics. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it seems that, um, we're we're missing the point if we're not meeting the needs of you know of the population that's out there. Um, what what strategies um, uh, when um, we talk about youth engagement um, approaches? Um, what would you recommend giving the population's tendency to try to stay hidden as a survival strategy? How do we how do we engage them? How do we count them and, and get them, you know, the services that they need. I mean, I think that, oh, go ahead, Ramon. Sorry. Uh, show up to providers. Like, even though we're not funded by the city, the, just the amount of people that we see, and yes, we don't stay within the parameters of age. We have an aftercare program also, but I mean, just, I'm sorry. It, it, it just boggled my mind. It's but um, yeah, I'm so like, just visit sites like ours, like Sylvia places, 
the non-traditional because I feel like the DYCD is only focusing on traditional city services, but we as a city, and if we want to really protect the vulnerable population, we have to think outside of what's city funded and actually deal deal with what's <laughs> actually happening out here. I'm sorry, I don't have the words to really- It's, it's, it's okay. I, I understand what you're saying. Um... Jamie, um, you know, uh, we know that the, the count happens during, you know, usually the coldest day of the year. How do we, um, how do we reach those young people who, you know, are not in the places that the count looks, you know, um, uh, in terms of finding them? Um, what do you think about the methodology? Uh, uh, how, how, how do we get, an effective, efficient count, you know, um, taking that into consideration? Well, I think that one, and I think Maddox and Alexander did a great job testifying to this, we have to listen to young people with lived experience. And by listen, I mean, don't just bring them to the table so that you can say they were there, bring them to the table and give them the power and the autonomy to actually inform what's happening. You know, supporting the YAB over the years, and especially with their involvement of the youth count, they have the answers, but DYCD just doesn't listen all the time. I think a very, you know, um, minor but, but telling example is I know that DYCD testified that the YAB was a part of the marketing tools that were put forth for the, for the count. DYCD sent out two versions of the marketing tools and asked the YAB which ones they thought were, were better, right? Represented the color scheme represented or would attract, you know, young people more. And then DYCD literally went with the color scheme that the YAB didn't vote for. You know, although that's like a very simple example, I think it's just telling. Don't just ask them for their input so you can put in your reports that they were involved. You have to actually take the feedback and, and, and implement it. Um, and I think that the other thing is, and I know I said in one of my recommendations, the, the numbers that are put forth and the numbers that are quoted by DYCD are the ones that meet the HUD definition. That does not mean that locally, right, DYCD cannot quote the much larger numbers that are also a part of the youth count, assuming that the 2020 report numbers will be the same because we haven't seen the report yet, so I don't know. But in 2019, right, they build out all the other information, unique information that they collect in the youth count that isn't collected during the HOPE count that produce much larger numbers of young people that are experiencing homelessness, as, as the coalition would agree that homelessness should be defined, right? Young people that are couch surfing or exchanging sex for shelter or are doubled up or in abandoned buildings. Those numbers don't go to HUD, but it doesn't mean that locally DYCD can't quote those numbers instead, which although we, wouldn't, we would argue still aren't 100% accurate, I think they're much more, uh, they represent much more accurately the actual population size. Thank you. Thank You're you. Um, you know, um, I, I, I know that the, the YAB, the YAB um, sent the letter um, which hasn't been responded to yet. Um, uh, I read many of the recommendations. I thought that they were um, very um, timely and on point and would increase the efficacy of, uh, of the count. Um, uh, one of my concerns was uh, that I I'm not sure that their relationship with DOE um, is the most um, effective and that, you know, I think they're missing an opportunity to, to collect some information that they might not have, you know, might, might be missing. So um, do you have um, any, any suggestions or, or do you, what efforts do you think should be made to strengthen the DYCD partnership with the Department of Education? to, you know, improve the efficacy of, of the count? I think, you know, and, and um, 
I don't want to misspeak, so I'm happy to follow up with you with, with the exact answer. Mm -hmm. But my understanding is that like all city agencies, DOE has a pretty intensive process that individuals need to go to to conduct research in, in the school facilities, which is what the youth count is, right? It's research. They have an IRB process. And my understanding from the meetings that I have attended regarding the youth count is that we don't get through the IRB process in time for the, D, for the DOE to be engaged in a way that I think would be as fruitful as we would like regarding their participation in the youth count. My understanding is that the DOE is not the individuals that are administering the youth count in the limited number of schools that it's conducted in, and that instead the surveys are conducted through community-based organizations that are uh, right under nonprofits that are housed in the DOE schools as a way to work around the IRB process because the, the approvals aren't obtained in time. And so I think that that speaks to, too, just the, the planning concerns around the youth count. I know that, again, Assistant Commissioner Scott testified that they start planning in May. Th right. those, maybe those are internal meetings that outsiders are not involved in, but the actual planning regarding bringing stakeholders in or even the YAB happen in the mid to, to late fall. Um, and so if that's the same time that they're submitting those requests from the DOE, it's, it's not surprising that we don't get into the schools. Thank you. You're welcome. I will also say regarding the 2021 count and you know, one of the things that was concerning in the testimony from the administration is they did not have youth count coordinators and my hat goes off to Miss Tracy Thorne and all of the time and effort that she personally put into the youth count, but she literally was the youth count this year. There was not program coordinators that were designated to the youth count. There has been in previous years, but for this year, like the YAB testified, a very difficult year given the pandemic and having to implement new innovative ways to reach young people to conduct the survey. BYCD did not employ outside individuals to come and support the count, um, which was concerning. So, um, so uh, the outcome of the count, uh, we feel, will, will probably be, again, um, result in an undercounting of, of young people that are out there. Yeah, I mean, the only example that we have to, to, I think, allude to the fact that 2021 is definitely not going to be a number we're going to be proud of as a city is that in 20, the numbers, when, the only numbers that we have from 2020 are just the, the, the raw data of the amount of electronic surveys that were administered. So it doesn't include the paper surveys and it, it isn't reflective of the number of young people that will be identified in those surveys as actually homeless, but just the number of surveys that were conducted in um, 2021 compared to 2020 is a, a fourth of the surveys that were conducted um, in 2020 were conducted in 2021 electronically. So already we're starting with that many less surveys being completed. You can only assume that the number of young people that are gonna be identified is going to be significantly less. Yeah, um, that that um, you know causes me concern because then I, I I worry about being able to meet the need and and the, in fact the the turnover in administration um, I I worry that they they won't have accurate numbers to continue to build upon um, and I, I don't want to see the program set back you know mm -hmm. I want to thank you for all of your work that you and Ramona are doing, you know, in this area. Uh, the document, the letter that was sent to DYCD was very comprehensive. Um, and I am, uh, I am very anxious to, to see that um, the meeting happens so that we can talk about the methodologies and, and how to improve the efficacy of of the um the youth count because excuse me uh, Chair, Chair Rose, excuse me I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry I just I just thought about something would you bring it up that the um the fact that the the data is recorded electronically there's a problem with that because so many homeless youth don't have that access either they don't have the means to keep their phones on 
and with you know places such as the Apple Store and Best Buy that were twenty four hours no longer providing twenty four hour, um, you know being open twenty four hour, and plus the fact that their phones get stolen, broken, it is hard for our homeless shoot to remain on technology that they need every single day, not only for things like the count, but to be productive in general. So that is a real flaw in the system. When you're trying to count homeless youth electronically, you're never going to be able to get an accurate count when the device is not accessible to the homeless youth. Yeah, and I think regarding Ramon's point, one of the recommendations I, I knew I was running out of time, so I didn't say out loud, was that um, for the virtual count this year with the pandemic, DYCD utilized WebEx, and I am far from a tech expert, but it is, at That's least from work. my experience, it's it's the least user-friendly mm -hmm, app to yeah. use. And despite the feedback from the YAB, right, because it's not a platform like Zoom or Google Meet where you just kind of click on a link and you're in the room, Right, to complete, you have to actually download a serve, uh, an app to mm -hmm. use WebEx. And so I, that was a concern that was brought forth, but the count continued to be conducted on WebEx. So I think that also highlights all of the points that Ramon's making. So even for young people that maybe found access to technology for the count, you're also asking them to download apps to complete a survey. Um, that's a very important point. You know, we saw, uh, you know, the digital divide. We saw the lack of access to um, equipment and broadband um, across the board. We saw that with our senior population. We saw that with, uh, you know, our young people in school um, not having access to equipment um, and, and the impact that it had. Um, so in addition to some of the um, sort of the, the built-in flaws in, in the youth count, um, they were exacerbated by COVID-19 and, um, and the additional um, issues that it, it provided for people to, to work remotely or, or electronically. Um, I thank you for bringing that up. Um, I think it's important for that to be a part of the record. Um, I know Council Member Chin and I, we're on the budget negotiating team and we work really hard to make sure that, you know, our, our, our populations get what they need. And so, um, you know, I, I thank you for, for um, being so precise about what happened and and what you know what needs what needs to be looked at in terms of resources so um does anyone um uh any are there any hands raised for anyone uh who has questions here rose there aren't any hands raised at this time but i would like to remind council members who have questions for a particular panelist to use the raise hand function and you'll be called after the panel has completed their testimony um but yes given that there are no other hands raised we can move on okay thank you Thank you, everyone. So I believe at this point we have concluded public testimony. However, if we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raised hand function and we will call on you in the order in which your hand was raised. I'll give everybody a minute to respond. Ramon, are you raising your hand? Is there anything you would like to share? No, I I think he's yeah. waving. So he's just waving, okay. <laughs> well, Chair Rose, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Okay. Yeah. Well, again, I, I wanna thank everyone who, um, who participated and testified at this hearing. Um, I wanna thank my colleagues for, for being here and, um, and for always making uh, our youth um, an important part of, of legislation and, and the budget 
um, the youth count is really important uh, and we can't afford to undercount uh, this very you know, vulnerable population. And so uh, I am going to continue to work with DYCD and with the providers to increase uh, the efficacy of, of the youth count and, and to look at the methodologies that might um, need to be changed so that uh, we can get an accurate count. So um, with that, I just wanna thank everybody for participating um, in today's hearing. And um, this hearing is now adjourned.